Otterbong Nakanga makes these great installations which have enormous aesthetic power but also as you dig into them they have layers of meaning and ways of thinking about the world that uh, are very very revealing. She was born in Nigeria um, she works in Antwerp in Belgium. She raises really interesting questions about the relationship of art and ecology or the environment, really urgent questions right now. And these ongoing themes take different forms, but in many ways uh, they're most layered and rich in installations. So you enter these installations that she makes and they're very strange worlds, um, very strange cartographies, not only because they, they map the space in really unusual ways, but also just because of the sheer range of materials that she brings together. So that sense of being from Africa, but also working in Belgium, the way she probes different relationships, different places, different transnational relations, I think is very important in the work. So there may be a, a sculpture which shows geological strata and the holes that have come from mining minerals. And then in another related form, the kinds of um, mountains that, of materials, of negative materials, the um, slag heaps and so on. She is the laureate because of the sheer quality of her work. It's not a history lesson, it's not a geography lesson. You know, the prize is awarded to an artist for a body of work, for a trajectory, for some sense of promise, for uh, an ability to move the language of sculpture forward, as I think Otterbong does in a very exciting way. The change from an annual award to a biennial award um, in part I think reflects a wish on the part of the Nasher to make a more substantial exhibition. There is longer preparation time both for the team at the Nasher and um, for the artists too. To be able to carve out more space to give more depth to the presentation of the work uh, in the context of the Nasher Prize can only be good. I think Nasher's ambition in going to a biennial award will be to put it even greater weight behind the, the choice in every two years. To really help give additional weight and to accelerate the process by which an artist who wins the Nasher Award becomes more widely known. Good afternoon. I'm Jeremy Strick, director of the Nasher Sculpture Center, and I am thrilled to welcome you to the Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium, this year honoring the work of 2025 Nasher Prize laureate Otoban Nakanga. The Nasher Prize is exemplary, not only in its dedication to the field of sculpture, but also in the breadth of its programs, including this symposium, which seek to deepen understanding and advance scholarship on each laureate. Over the next four days, we will hear graduate students from around the world share research on Otoban Nakanga, addressing such topics as hospitality, landscape commodification, and trans-territorial ecology. Papers given during this graduate symposium will later be published in a printed compendium with our new biennial format, this edition will be printed in 2025, allowing our presenters more time to develop their ideas and sharpen their arguments for publication. Before introducing our moderator, I'd like to recognize the energetic and generous support from donors and partners who allow the Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium and other Nasher Prize programs to flourish. I'd like to note 
that we will hold a virtual roundtable discussion this Friday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, where audience members can pose questions to panelists, followed by a keynote address by artist and curator Maria Magdalena Campos Pan. I'll also note that the week's presentations will be recorded and made available online. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce this year's moderator, Trey Burns. Trey Burns is an artist, writer, curator, and educator, currently teaching new media at the University of North Texas. Since 2018, he has been co-director of Sweet Pass Sculpture Park, a nonprofit arts organization that provides space and support for experimental and large-scale outdoor works by emerging voices. In 2023, Sweet Pass received a grant from the National Endowment for the Arts for their innovative alternative education and exhibition program, Sculpture School. Burns has shown his work both in the United States and abroad, including the Pavilion Vendôme in clichy la garenne France, the Malaquais Gallery at École Nationale Supérieure d'Architecture de Paris, Malaquais in Paris, France, Wesseyac Projects in Wesseyac, New York, Tarleton State University in Stephenville, Texas, Wells College in Aurora, New York, and et al. Project in Brooklyn, New York. His most recent work, Prairie Peace, is currently on view in the public gallery at the Nasher Sculpture Center. Referring to an expanded notion of landscape, history, and ecology, Prairie Peace offers interesting parallels to some of the conversations we may hear this week. His writing has recently been published by the Holt Smithson Foundation and in Southwest Contemporary, The Nasher, and Burnaway. It is now my pleasure to turn the proceedings over to Trey, who will begin our program and introduce our five graduate PATH participants. Thank you, Jeremy. <clears throat> and thank you to the Nasher Sculpture Center and to everyone uh, gathered here today for the Nasher Prize Graduate Symposium. Uh, my name is Trey Burns, and I have the wonderful honor of being your moderator this week and the pleasure of getting to know the work of these scholars by riding shotgun to their presentations. So if you have any questions during the course of the, these presentations, you can feel free to put them in the chat, and we'll make sure to address those in the roundtable discussion that's occurring on, on Friday at 12 p.m. Central Standard Time. So with that, let's jump right in. In assembling materials and preparation for this event, I sought out catalogs that trace the arc of Odebong Nkanga's work. Amidst the pages, my attention was captured by the 2021 exhibit of Chords Curling Around Mountains, presented at the Castello di Rivoli Museo d'Arte Contemporanea in Turin, Italy. Here, my eye was drawn to a pollen yellow wall and the dramatic unfurling of a thick black cotton rope spilling across the bichy beige floor of the museum. Suggesting an astral or perhaps umbilical connection, the rope snakes through the galleries across artist-made carpets and loops through large ceramic globes like massive beads. The line of the cord sketches invisible boundaries or borders around the rooms while forging a tangible link between the smaller, gently sculpted entities. Some are from glass, Others hewn from a fallen beech tree, a wood commonly found in the mountains surrounding Turin. Small niches in many of the forms hold bits of local soil, herbs, soap shavings, red palm oil, and incense. It is here that I must confess that experiencing this work through documentation is frustrating. One misses the depth of its nuances, the richness of aromas, the subtlety of textures, and the whispers of sound. However, looking at this serpentine rope tying together forms containing multitudes, it dawned on me that this is what we're doing here this week, connecting and linking together ideas. Odebong Nkanga has charted a remarkable career with a multi multidisciplinary practice that spans sculpture, drawing, painting, textiles, photography, performance, installation, and poetry. Growing up in Lagos, in Paris and now residing in Antwerp, Nkanga's work delves into the intricate narratives of migration, the ceaseless exploitation of the Earth's resources, 
and the profound connection between humans and the land. She is a cartographer of physical landscapes and a seeker of the unseen ties that bind us to our planet and to each other. In an introductory text for Nkonga's catalog, when looking across the sea, do you dream? Sylvain Lezan, director of Villa Arsant in Nice, observes that the work possesses a strong evocative power despite its smooth aspect. This smoothness brings to mind the sleek, inviting glow of technology and its inviting uh, user-friendly interface and minimalist shell hiding its complex inner workings. This ubiquitous technology's simplicity also masks its reliance on largely invisible and Byzantine systems of mining, manufacturing, and distribution. In her work, Double Plot 2018, a sumptuous, inky, dark tapestry, Nkanga addresses these visions of mass networks through a schematic of disembodied arms reaching outward, connecting across expansive supply chains to form a constellation of labor. The monumental work, over 25 feet wide, highlights the complexity of the myriad systems that undergird our lives and vastly overshadow the individual. Their mythic proportion and epic sprawl feel fitting for the historically narrative meeting, medium of tapestries. And this is a subject to be explored further by Bram Groteman of the University of Amsterdam in their presentation later this week. And Conga's work aligns with what T.J. Demos describes in their book, Decolonizing Nature, Contemporary Art, and the Politics of Ecology, as a, quote, artistic practice dedicated to interlinking biological, technological, social, and political ecologies. Her work tackles the big themes, immigration, the capitalist scene, the scars of colonialism, with a tactile intimacy that brings the issues of both the landscape and the body close to the viewer. On Wednesday, Veronica Kamai from Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi will explore how Nkanga's works resonates with the perspective outlined in Demos's book, as well as with Anna Singh's seminal text, The Mushroom at the End of the World. Kamai aims to illuminate the radical ideas these works propose and the possibilities that emerge in our new normal. In Nkanga's work, minerals, metals, stones, and plants become eloquent heralds narrating tales of their beginnings, their metamorphoses, and the ecological crises they cause on our environment and ourselves. In the 2014 work, In Pursuit of Bling, presented at the Berlin Biennale, Nkanga unveiled a multimedia narrative that centered on the mineral mica, exploring its numerous industrial applications from cosmetics to electronics and the environmental impact of its extraction in her home country of Nigeria. <clears throat> and Conga's exploration of exploitation mirrors Texas and its dialogue with its own resources, a reflection on the, the land's bounty and the weight of its use. Hollowed out prairies turn to cotton fields, endless horizons of cattle grazing, and the oil-soaked narratives stretching from spindle top to the deep water horizon tragedy. This state, known for leading in the production of cement, clay, stone, and gypsum, offers its building supplies to the world. The hole in the mind, the hole in the mind, as Lucy Lepard describes, is the quote, reverse image of the cityscape that it creates, extraction in aid of erection. In Conga's work is an inquiry into the essence of belonging, a questioning of what it means to be rooted not only to place, but to the very ground beneath our feet, deep into the soil, and what that soil offers up. Consider, for example, her series of performances involving the kola nut. In a recent discussion about her work, Nkanga shared a fascinating narrative about the kola nut's journey from its roots in West African rituals to America, carried in the pockets of enslaved individuals, and how it eventually became a key ingredient in the soft drink that bears its name. For Nkanga, the act of sharing, breaking open and consuming the kola nut together, becomes a simple yet profound communion. It is a beautiful and radical gesture that speaks to themes of memory, oral history, and shared connections. I'm eager to learn about these themes further, along with the broader topic of hospitality in today's presentation by Alarege Bere of the University of Texas at Dallas. In the spirit of this hospitality, I would like to begin the symposium 
not merely as a series of presentations about an artist, but as an invitation to conversation, one that traverses continents and disciplines, challenges and inspires, and asks us not to consider what art is, but what Nkanga shows us it has the power to do. I thank Nkanga for this beautiful work and these scholars for their ideas, and again, the Nasher Sculpture Center for providing this opportunity for us to gather around it. So up first, we have an African philosophy of hospitality, Levin Asian perspectives on Audubon and Conga's contained measures of Icolanut by Alarege Bere of the University of Texas at Dallas. So with that, let's jump right in. Uh, Alarege, the floor is yours. Thank you, Trey, for your introduction, and again to the Nasher for uh, hosting this graduate symposium and to everyone listening. Um, as the conference uh, papers have a way of evolving, so you can think of sort of this, this as a subtitle of sorts, the secondary title. Um, but yeah, it's still it's still sort of concerned with ethnophilosophy, philosophy, with sort of with, uh, and particularly with this uh, performance piece, contained measures of a cola nut. Um, in his reassessment uh, of Senghor's, the Senghorian philosophy of Africanity, uh, the Sen Senegalese thinker Suleiman Bashir Diagne directs uh, readers' attention to Senghor's argument that, uh, quote, there's a truth in African art that is itself a form of philosophy. And I think this notion of the African artist philosopher, which is actually its first articulated within uh, Placid Temples' is a seminal and deeply contentious work, Bantu philosophy, is despite like it, 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 its presence right at the beginning uh, of, of modern African philosophy is not one that has received a thorough examination from subsequent generations of Africanist philosophers who are interested in the ways that endogenously generated African thought can be assimilated into or uh, otherwise engaged in dialogue with the epistemological framework of Western academic philosophy. Um, even advocates for ethnophilosophy's uh, enduring relevance in the wake of very vigorous critiques from luminaries like Kwasi Wuredu or Polan Hutonji uh, remain broadly reluctant to incorporate artistic expression as either a foundational source or, or, or a method for developing culturally specific philosophical discourse. Um, by way of example, a, a recent ethnophilosophy anthology called um, Ethnophilosophy and the Search for the Wellspring of African Philosophy, edited by uh, the notable uh, Calabar School philosopher Ada Agata, another Nigerian, and featuring other prominent figures in the field, only very briefly touches on, on African arts and not at all in, in a philosophical mode. Um, even African artists explicitly engaging in philosophical creation, maybe the most famous example being the Ugandan poet Okot Bipitek, or, or contemporary multidisciplinary artists like Issa Sam or Otobong Nkonga, are, 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 are seldom recognized as legitimate interlocutors for African philosophers working today. And uh, I, today I kind of want to seriously consider Diagne's proposition that contemporary and sort of this extension he makes to it in an associated paper, that contemporary African artists do not need to have immediate access to traditional metaphysics in order to fruitfully engage in, in African philosophical endeavor. Uh, by focusing on, on, on Nkanga as a case study, particularly this performance uh, contained measures of a colonet, and uh, reading it through the lens of, of both Levinas on, on hospitality and Henry Odera Oruka's uh, sage philosophy, which is a, 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 a current within sort of the ethno-philosophical tradition in Africana. Uh, I also want to sort of consider uh, Nkanga's performance as a contribution to the broader philosophy of hospitality. I'm not very interested in keeping Africana philosophy in sort of in a kiddie pool where it only interacts with itself. Um, and, and maybe, you know, through that, trying to bridge some of these uh, persistent gaps between African artistic expression and philosophical discourse uh, by recentering Nkanga's work as a form of embodied lived philosophy and, you know, maybe get at the parameters of what constitutes a legitimate philosophical inquiry. So in her performance piece, uh, Contained Measures of a Kola Nut, there's uh, the Nigerian Audubon Nkanga really deftly harnesses the enduring symbolic potency of the kolona across a number of, of West African cultures, uh, largely centered in Nigeria, but around the, 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 the Bight of Biafra more generally. 
in many ways, it's a contemporary articulation of the deeply rooted spiritual and, and social and even an economic significance that the seed has embodied for centuries among groups like the Igbo peoples or, or the Ibibio people, uh, a member which uh, Hui Nkanga is a member of. And if you haven't seen them, uh, kola nuts are, are, are produced by trees which are native to At Atlantic Africa's tropical forest. They, the fruit consists of like these two to 12 nuts uh, enclosed in an apple-sized oblong-shaped uh, carpel. And, the, and while, you know, the yam and the kola nut are, are known to, to the neighbors of the people uh, of, the, of the Cross River and the Bight of Biafra, uh, these, those people, in particular the Igbo, the Ibibio, the Anang, the Oron, are unique in sort of the really high degree of, of social and spiritual importance they, attra they attach to these two products, and particularly the kola nut. Um, I mean, as a as a, as a as a Igbo elder put it very recently, uh, the Igbo accord the kola nut a, a special recognition and a reverential uh, manner. Uh, and there's even sort of anthropologically, when people talk about becoming Igbo, I mean, this process of Igboization that happens in towards in the 1800s, uh, 1700s in in West Africa, it begins sort of with the embrace of kola nut reverence. It's the like the first move to becoming Igbo. And I mean, there's, uh, I think the most famous invocation of this is, is Chinua Achebe in Things Fall Apart, mentioning that sort of he who brings cola brings life. And I, that's like a, a great encapsulation of, it's a restatement actually of an existing uh, Igbo uh, aphorism. And it sort of, uh, it, it, it kind of elucidates this central role that it plays. And in Kanga's Ibibio heritage is, is likewise steeped in, in, in these traditions intertwining the kola nut with spirituality and especially hospitality, as she herself notes in several of the conversations conducted as part of the con performance. Um, hospitality rights centering the kola nut underscore its, its really foundational significance in fortifying social bonds and enacting ethical principles of respect and especially reciprocity. Um, similarly, the kola nut emerges as this anchoring almost totemic uh, presence in contained measures, even though it is removed from the original system of science that give it meaning in uh, in, in Igbo and Ibibio uh, philosophy and, and culture, but it's still imbued with these sacred energies sort of reverberating through its use, particularly with hosting and hospitality. Um, across Igbo and Ibibio communities, uh, the formal presentation of kola nuts to visitors constitutes this mandatory first act of hosting. It sort of opens the space for engagement. And it's 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 both a ceremonial acknowledgement of the guest's arrival, but also sort of a, a, a method of spiritual integration into the community through the invocation of these ancestral blessings. And I do want to spend some time with the way this works with the this sort of I, you could call it almost like the traditional forebear to contain measures of the kola nut. Uh, this process of breaking the nut, as as Trey mentioned, uh, the first step sort of involves the the relay presentation of the kola nut that recognizes everyone present in order of their relationship to the host. It represents sort of the symbolic travel of the kola nut to the respective hometowns of of all the adult males present and. It is important that that it's all adult males. Which we'll return to that. Um, with the colon eventually sort of coming back to the host. Um, the second step consists in the offer of prayers to the ancestors, uh, usually by the oldest male present. Um, and then the third act is where you get the actual breaking, the snapping of the kola nut by the oldest male present or his delegate who would give one of the lobes to the ancestor by throwing it on a shrine or on the ground as might be deemed appropriate or taking one piece for himself. And then the youngest male present would pass all the remaining pieces to the people gathered. And the remainder, remainder is returned to the host as a uh, Aka Oji, uh, which literally is translated to the hand of the kola nut, but it actually refers to the share the hand of the person, the hand of the person who brings the kola nut to the group. And I mean, in this sort of hierarchical relay presentation of the kola nuts and these invocational prayers, the eldest male's ceremonial breaking and distribution is very literally like a microcosm of the both the communitarian ethics and like a gerontocratic authority. Uh, in, in, in Igbo and Abibio culture, um, this particular form is taken from the Cross River Igbo, which is sort of like the most well-studied form of the traditional uh, Igbo, uh, like colon hospitality ritual. But variations of this exist all throughout sort of the, the Bight of Biafra region. 
And older men's handling sort of initiates the descent of spiritual potency into material form, while the youngest male there's role in, in providing the final dispersal to all present signifies this intergenerational unity and the perpetuation of wisdom uh, across age cohorts. So by centering her pres performance around the ceremonial breaking and chewing and consuming of the kola nut, Nkanga initiates this like deeply corporeal engagement with these cultural meanings. And I mean, also sort of amplifies these symbolic registers. Again, because we're not sort of operating as as Igbo people in, or Ibibio people in, 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 a, in a traditional setting, these uh, the choreographed aesthetic elements of the of, of the performance piece sort of give us a way to kind of resituate ourselves in that system of reciprocity without having direct access to 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 that life world. Um, you see here in this photo, the suspended decanter, it's dripping amber colon extracts, and it like it really suggests this process of distillation and transfiguration. And what's interesting to me is that this actually isn't sort of that that the extract, the importance of the extract is not a particularly Ebo or Bibio um engagement with the colonut. Um, this is actually a very Hausa way of going at about with the Hausa people live in northern Nigeria. Um and it is perhaps of note that, that Nkanga, although she is Ibibio, is actually born in Kano in, 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 a, in a house, a town, a northern Nigeria city. Um, and it's it's interesting because it sort of brings multiple ways of looking at a kola nut um, together. And, and I mean, also in and 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 uh, like the the photo collage woven tapestries depicting the kola nut and these literally rooted uh, female figures, they suggest really cosmological resonances with fecundity, uh, interconnections between human and botanical realms, uh, which is again a very Igbo and a Bibio. I mean, the idea that the kola nut itself is a conversation partner in the what what when you break it and use it sort of as an entrance to hospitality, and I mean ultimately. Uh, uh, Nkanga transmutes this like the really quotidian and mythologized act of kola nut consumption into a locus for, for very intentional dialogue by imposing this prerequisite of a mutual kola nut partaking to enable candid conversations. Again, as sort of Igbo and Ibibio people would, uh, she like really reifies the C's role as a conduit for fortifying the practice of truth telling and the honoring of, 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 of relationships between parties. Um, it's almost like a reanimation of, of the colon that's importance as a sanctified medium for enacting these core ethical and, and spiritual precepts underpinning West African philosophies of community and, and venerative relationships with the natural world. Um, and then I, if we want to consider this performance in particular as a work of philosophy, uh, the Kenyan philosopher Henry Odera Oruka's sage philosophy provides us a useful lens to begin with. I think this is both because he, he does try to bridge gaps between the ethno-philosophical and the professional currents uh, of African philosophy, but also being realistic because he gives us this really helpful systemization of various ways to think about indigeneity uh, in thought. And Aruka defines, he makes this a famous distinction between philosophic sages and folkloric sages. Um, he defines the philosophic sage as individuals who sort of display sustained rational reflection and critical evaluations of beliefs while also expressing a coherent worldview shaped by like lived African experiences and African cultural context, kind of threading the middle between the ethno-philosophical trying to like sort of express a Volksgeist of an African people. And then, of course, someone like Widedu say, saying that, you know, only professional academic philosophy is real African philosophy. Uh, and I think that contemporary African artists like Nkanga can and do operate within this conception of the philosophic sage uh, through their creative practices. While Aruka's work centered on rural sages from his Kenyan homeland, uh, his conceptualization of the philosophic sage holds like a, a, a much broader applicability and relevance. I think particularly Nkanga through this creative practice and engagement with her own heritage in, in a transformed way can be understood as embodying the spirit of the philosophic sage. Um, it's a key component of the framework is of, of, of Aruka's framework is the tendency of philosophic sages to express dissatisfaction with the status quo, uh, belief systems of their community, and to even sub and to subject accepted customs and knowledge to rational scrutiny. And as Aruka states, uh, and I'm quoting here, uh, a philosophic sages owe, owe greater greater loyalty to their own thought than to custom for its own sake, uh, and. 
contain measures of a cold net can sort of be viewed as an embodiment of sage philosophy through this configure reconfiguration of gender norms surrounding the use of the cola nut in West African cultures, particularly Igbo and Abibio cultures. Um, the formal presentation and breaking of the cola nut that we just described has historically been an exclusively male dominated practice in Abibio communities or Igbo communities. And, and this gender based exclusion of women from cola nut rituals is often upheld as like a as an inviolable viable tradition, even among sort of communities well beyond the the, the Igbo land or Ibibio land uh, heartland in, in sort of the the Bight of Biafra. Um, sort of, there's a very interesting paper discussing this, particularly among Igbo folks in Belgium. Uh, you know, of course, where Ingmus and Congo is from, and this gender-based uh, exclusion is sort of it, it's is something that doesn't sort of register at first glance until you, unless you know you're familiar with the, the 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 movements and and the ritual almost. The, the the ways in which it, the the rhythmic invocation of 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 the cola, of the ancestral spirits as you open the cola nut, and by deliberately choosing to host the ceremonial breaking and consumption of the cola nut as a woman, uh, and Kanga really directly challenges and disrupts this uh, this gender hierarchy in a in a really striking way. If you are an Igbo or a Bibio person, um, the idea that the host who breaks the nut is a woman is is like a something that's immediately striking. Um, and I, I don't want to sort of, and I, I really can't overstate this. Like, um, it, it's it, it's not that it, it doesn't sort of come across at all in in sort of Western engagements with this work with contained uh, measures of the cola nut, but um, it it is it it does sort of it, it hits much different uh, if you're if you're working for if you're working within sort of an Igbo uh, uh, thought world. And I mean, this. I think that this performance serves as Aruka's kind of act of rational scrutiny, sort of interrogating the validity of worth of a customary belief, even as you know, you sort of you valorize the parts of it that are meaningful and are, are actually like you know deeply threatened by Western ways of in, of being in community. And I think by doing so, sort of Aruka exemplifies uh, she or Nkanga exemplifies Aruka's definition of the philosophic sage, sort of a beyond moving beyond sort of the folkloric, just sort of like transmission uh, of ideas about a people and sort of shaping them. Uh, and I think that this that that at this point, it's worth sort of inquiring about what exactly she does for the philosophy of hospitality by through this engagement, and. As, by way of explanation, I kind of want to look back at Levinas and the roots of, 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 of the philosophy of hospitality to see how she, she goes about sort of interacting with it. Um, while the practice of hospitality, of course, stretches across cultures and centuries, it's the 20th century French philosopher Emmanuel Levinas who catalyzes its rearticulation as a foundational concept for ethical philosophy. Levinas has these really penetrating investigations into the face-to-face -face encounter with the other that provides the groundwork for contemporary philosophies of hospitality. And in a very real way for Levinas, hospitality lies at the core of ethics itself. And of course, for, ethic, for Levinas, ethics is, is the heart of philosophy itself. And as he states in the preface to, to Totality and Infinity, this book will uh, present subjectivity as welcoming the other as hospitality. Um, and central to Levinas' philosophy is the idea of the other, capital O, other, as radically different, like irreducible to the same, the absolute stranger who exceeds our attempts to comprehend or contain them within our conceptual frameworks. Uh, he writes that the other is other, he and I do not form a number, the collective in which I say you or we is not a plural of the I. And this really, this radical alterity, uh, it disrupts the totalizing tendencies of what he calls the self-same. Um, our inclination to resolve the unknown through categories and representations is really violently breached by the infinite transcendent otherness confronting us in the face-to-face -face encounter. For Levinas, the face is not just a mere empirical visage, but like an expression that shatters all these plastic representations we might form of the other. And this ethical relation is, for Levinas, really fundamentally asymmetrical. The other assumes this metaphysical height akin to the divine, while the I is rendered subordinate, like it's obligated, he says, to an infinite responsibility. Um, and as Derrida, and Derrida sort of highlights this apparaea at the heart of Levinasian hospitality, the unconditional welcoming of the arrivant kind of obliterates the very conditions of hospitality itself. 
the the bounded sovereignty, the inside outside, the power to hostility that makes hospitality itself possible as a voluntary offering. And if for Derrida in particular, uh, Levinasian hospitality uh, perpetually oscillates between this unattainable ideal of absolute openness and the inevitability of subscription through norms or particularities or the potential for hospital hospital or hostility. Um, and it's this tension that lends hospitality's ethical urgency for Derrida. Um, while retaining fidelity to Levinas's insights, I believe, uh, Derrida's thinking exposes a lot of these constitutive paradoxes haunting any pure ethics of hospitality. And from this sort of Levinasian Derrida uh, framework, uh, fr subsequent thinkers have elaborated hospitality's ethical modalities across like spatial, political, corporeal, even affective registers. Uh, feminist philosophers in particular have challenged hospitality's patriarchal framings and recentered it as an embodied ethic originating from the, the labor, from female, the feminine labor of, of nurturing, sustaining life um, and care in general, sort of hospitality as an ethics of care. Uh, Maurice Hammington is probably the leading voice uh, articulating this. And for Hammington, uh, traditional masculinist concepts of, of hospitality cast it as a sovereign prerogative of the male host to receive guests into his domain through this almost like an extension of property rights. Um, and hospitality on these terms reinscribes sort of these problematic boundaries between public, private, inside, outside, and, and, and this self-possessed individuality. And in contrast, Hamington sort of frames hospitality as rooted in the corporeal and domestic realms attended to by women's work, uh, childbirth, child rearing, homemaking, and caretaking, while not sort of taking them as they are. Um, far from a, a voluntary e economy of exchange, Women's lived experiences reveals hospitality is an inescapable and originary condition uh, of ethical vulnerability and, and really vital interdependence. And from this feminist vantage, hospitality is not just like a manner of autonomously choosing to receive others, but it's from the, the very fact of being embodied and having this kind of and, and sharing that relationship to the other. Now, I think at the same time, feminists like Hamilton or McNulty uh, retain the apparatic kernel from Derrida of the impossible ideal of unconditional welcome as like a really disruptive summons exceeding all codifications for both uh, true hospitality must remain excessive to, uh, and, and, and open to the per perpetual like renegotiation of its limits and conditions in response to the call. Uh, ultimately, this feminist lineage enriches the, 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 the Levinasian paradigm by recentering hospitality as an embodied care-based ethos. Now, I'm interested in sort of the, the in Kanga's theory of, of uh, in, in Kanga's work, uh, cont contained measures as, of a kola nut, as almost like a parallel tradition to this criticism of the philosophy of hospitality, but not quite coming from the same uh, root. I mean, because while in Conga's piece certainly resonates with the tension between unconditional, ideal, and situated conditionalities, the, the her cosmological framing is really different. It like queers the the, the binarism of, of the same and other. It's not like rather than sort of, and even you see this with Hamilton and McNulty and, and Ben Habib. I mean, because they're still it's rooted in that Levinasi and subjects affront to, like the the being faced with the other's alterity, right? The ceremonial hospitalities surrounding the kola nut ritual and kola nut reverence encode this, this African philosophy of relationality that is, that is completely different. I mean, even sort of the, not just mutual inter interdependence, but a constitutive coexistence of plural selves in a very real way. Um, Sanghor notes this break with Levinas in African relationality. He writes that in his words, the Negro African, uh, quote, lives in common life with the other, capital o, other, he lives in symbiosis. And as articulated by sort of, you know, the, the, the famous Ubuntu philosophers or Hunhuist philosophers like Ramos or, or Stan Lake Samkange, or nowadays with uh, some of the contemporary writers on Ubuntu like Thaddeus Metz, uh, this sort of relational moral thought poses a really decisive contrast to like a, a, the liberal individualism that I feel like is not fully escaped in, in Hamilton. And, and its assumptions of these self-sufficient rational agents negotiating obligations. Instead, the self here, when you sit at the table and eat, the you break cola. Uh, the, the self has become sort of porous. Uh, it's it like you know it it, it it speaks to this way in which 
cells are constituted through these cross-pollinating relationships, yes, of, of care, but of, of communion and also like a, a, of, of almost like ecosystemic cohesion with others, with the kola nut as your, as your interlocutor. So when Nkanga initiates participants into the truth-bearing ceremony of kola hospitality, she doesn't really think about their subjectivities as like discrete autonomous cores encountering the radical other and trying to work out how we can, you know, make the impossible leap. Uh, but she instead, like sort of convokes them into this ethical field where mutualities with both human and non-human others are themselves like the ontological grounds for selfhood and moral responsibility. I mean, the symbolic resonances of the kola nut uh, as that which is offered and shared, catalyzing uh, agreements, mediating blood ties, invoking ancestral forces, as we saw sort of the, the calling to the ancestors, all point to hospitality, not really as the imperative to accommodate an other from an antecedent position of security or self-sovereignty, or even as, as sort of like a, a, an imposition being forced to sort of enact care. Uh, but it sort of reveals these almost poetic protocols for reconstituting the self through, these, uh, re through this reciprocity embodied almost or contained literally contained within the kola nut um and these like you know exchanges and also like almost like this venerative relationship to the world around them in, in a very animist way um if to put it simply uh if levinas positions the ethical summons as issuing from the face of the other in conga through the kola nut repatriates that like transcendent demand to this world like imminent in the vegetable materiality and even like almost the nutritive interdependence and the common atmospheres that sustain communities across generations. Um, you can see that with sort of the photos of some of these like sort of looking at, at, at other kola nut uh, ceremonies beyond where we have this, this example of, yeah, like the sort of the, the serving vessels uh, of the past. Um, her hospitality is not really the paralytic ideal of openness to a sovereign, all-powerful guest, but a concrete praxis uh, of mutual embodied um, sort of uh, meeting uh, through this mediated by the kola nut. I mean, while still, I feel like there are still resonances with, with Derrida's pos positioning of hospitality as the crucible where these intentions between conditional laws and unconditional ideals are worked out. It's a very divergent philosophical vocabulary, and it's not this ritual doesn't really operate through the logic of enclosure or territory, but the choreography of receiving and offering it enacts like this sort of negotiation and hearing of this like interdependent ethical universe of, of trans individual personhood that is, it, it sort of can only, that has like an entirely different genealogy from the ways in which we've tried to, to think about post Levinasian hospitality. Um, and, you know, as we sort of thinking about like kind of, what this might mean for us is that like, well, how do we, well, how do we think about this African, this, this Senghorian uh, uh, African philo uh, artist philosopher that in Congo seems to be working within this, 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 uh, the, the, and, and it's, and how do we sort of think about that as people working within a Western tradition? And I mean, of course, I think our minds go to Nietzsche first, right? He, he envisioned the, the, the artist philosopher as like this solitary heroic figure who, who transcends uh, conventional morality is almost like a legislator. The artist philosopher is also a priest and a prophet, a creator of new values. Um, but it's not sort of the only one. I mean, for Senghor, Nietzsche is very important, but so is uh, Henri Bergson. And I feel like his concepts provide a framework for understanding a Senghor's notion of the African artist philosopher. Uh, in in terms that are perhaps closer to ours, or at least make it more a bit a bit more accessible in the way that Nkanga does, sort of for the African for an African philosophy of hospitality. And at the core of Senghor's vision is the idea that African art, of course, contains these truths and wisdoms that constitute a form of philosophy rooted in the African experience. And Berkson's concepts of intuition and duration are are, are kind of useful for translating this, uh, according to Berkson. Uh, Great works of art are always a product of the artist's inability, ability or inability to intuitively grasp and communicate these truths of reality and being, uh, which kind of aligns with Senghor's view of African artists channeling almost these, what he calls rhythmic metaphysical insights. Uh, and he posits that this kind of artistic intuition allows a kind of non-conceptual communication between artists and audience, bonding them in this really intimate duration where emotions and even ontological realities are shared across minds. And as with 
Bergson's duration, sort of the truth within African art, if we are willing to sort of take it seriously as philosophy, escapes personal subjectivity. It belongs both to the artist and spectator, but it's also like independent from them both. And I mean, it resonates with sort of Senghor's investment of art with sort of a really profound, almost civilizational significance. And, and for both thinkers, Bergson and Senghor, art provides like this really unique po portal into holistic penetrating insight that conceptually bound philosophies can't reach. Um, so I, I, I think that both in, in if we're going to use Bergson's philosophy vocabulary, the, the, the artist philosopher in this mold that we're talking about, the sage artist, perhaps, is one that's uh, capable of sort of seizing uh, the heterogeneous duration of, of, of African life and experience. And I think it's at this uh, crossing that we find in Conga, really like revitalizing the academic tradition uh, of artistic practice, even as she roots herself in, in African soil. And I, I think I'd like to leave us with that concluding thought uh, of placing in Conga there, perhaps somewhere. Right. All right. Well, thank you all so much for joining us today. And thank you, uh, Alarege, for that uh, wonderful presentation. I mean, that was tr truly special. So um, um, that, just remember to tune in again tomorrow uh, at 12 p.m. CST, right here at the same link, where we'll be joined by two more scholars, uh, Veronica Kamai of Jawaharlal Nehru Uni uh, University in New Delhi, India, and uh, Margaret Nagawa of Inner Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. So thank you so much, and uh, we hope to see you tomorrow.